Hello, my name is James Mickens, and I am glad to be opening the Velocity Conference. Let it be known that I am an American, okay, and I offer you my protection. This conference is going to be a success precisely because an American is here. Now, I know that many of you think that Americans just want to blow stuff up and tell people what to do, but I can assure you Americans are smart, okay? For example, I learned how to speak German in three days. So when I showed up at the Boston airport, I was already fluent. Auf Wiederhausen. Deutschmarks, Flugticket, danke schön, Lufthansa, Lufthansa, äh, Lufthansa, Lufthansa, ja, ich bin ein Berliner, ja, Herr JFK, Data Garden, Data Garden, Akchong, it's the father, nein, nein, ja, ja, ja. As you can tell, I am a level seven German speaker, and there are only six levels. So please stop by my session tomorrow using hand gestures instead of conjugating verbs properly. It's going to be fun. But that's not what my keynote is about. My keynote is actually about some bad ideas in tech that refuse to die. These ideas cling to life despite the fact that we all know better. So let's start with an easy one first. In the modern day, who is still a blockchain person? These people were supposed to be wiped out by the asteroid strike, and yet they walk amongst us. I want to understand them. Much like Ask Ketchum, the beloved star of the Pokemon cartoons, I take great pleasure in cataloging the different types of blockchain enthusiasts. For example, look behind that shrub. It's someone trying to sell you an enterprise blockchain. Hey, little buddy, what's the technical difference between an enterprise blockchain and a regular distributed database? Hmm, huh, well, huh. <laughs> you mean to tell me that there is no deep technical difference and that you're just using the buzzword blockchain to exploit the ignorance of qualitative CTOs who haven't used technology since the War of 1812? Hmm, huh, bah. <laughs> Are you secretly admitting? that people have been encrypting and signing data for millennia. Parents teaching children, teaching their children. AES, RSA, the formulas written on cave walls and ancient scrolls of wisdom, providing the secrecy and integrity that you tell people can only be achieved using enterprise blockchains. Nothing to, say, to see here, says the enterprise blockchain salesman. But wait, what's that rustling in the trash can over there? Is it a raccoon? No, it's a permissionless blockchain enthusiast. This kind of person is fixated on the following question. In a world that has no trust relationships whatsoever, how can we build a distributed transaction system? But let me tell you this. If you wake up and you discover that you're living in a world that has no trust relationships whatsoever, you should be asking questions like, how do I know that my medicine isn't poison? How do I stop my potatoes from being stolen by dingoes? Because anybody can own a dingo in a world without trust. Why is Xandar the hill person pointing a crossbow at my hutmate Elmira? Do you see what I'm saying? Like, this is what a world without trust looks like. You've got bigger problems than just improving the transaction throughput of a permissionless ledger. Now, of course, improving the transaction throughput is an obsession of these cryptocurrency people. But why do these people still exist? See, these cryptocurrency enthusiasts, they're like cicadas or vampires. They're not dead, they're just sleeping. They've coated themselves in tokens and allowed the falling valuations to push them deep into the earth, where they slumber until speculators temporarily boost the price of the tokens, only to bid the prices back down because cryptocurrencies are a nightmare. They're like the one ring or vaping. Once you start, you get corrupted. Little Timmy here purchased his first token two years ago. And after three hard forks, two stolen wallets, and five cryptocurrency bankruptcies, little Timmy is living on the street, analyzing technical indicators for spare change. Ah, but you might say, James, you're being unfair. We can fix these problems with more advanced cryptocurrencies. If you're worried about volatility, use stable coins that are pegged to a fiat currency. If you're worried about inflation or deflation, you can use algorithmic monetary policy. If you're worried about fraud, you can run auditing tools over the transactions in the ledger. Well, all this is great, but I got a question for you. Is there another thing that can be pegged to a fiat currency and managed via monetary policy and verified using audits? 
The answer is yes, it's called money. Regular money. Newsflash, money exists. If you want to make money better, why not try to just improve money instead of starting with a disaster and then trying to improve the disaster? It's like, imagine that I wanted to make cars better. Have you heard of my new invention, Donkey 4000? It's got some pretty good features like uh, halogen lights and airbags. However, it does have some bad features like it's a donkey, okay? Eats your shoes, it mostly doesn't go where you want it to go, it kicks you in the face at arbitrary moments. So do you, do you see what I'm saying? These blockchain people, they're living in a donkey world, but they just refuse to listen to reason. So this is why I claim that blockchain evangelism is the purest form of mansplaining that is known to science. Do you want to guess how many times a man has been at a party and a woman has verbally assaulted him about the blockchain? Zero times. This has never happened, okay? In contrast, just this morning, 18 different men have come up to me and asked me if I want to talk about smart contracts, okay? The answer is eternal no, okay? It's a no that is repeating infinitely towards the heat death of the universe. Now, of course, at least one of these men will eventually tell me that I should look him up on Twitter. But here are some facts about me. It's a poem about myself that I wrote by myself. So here's the poem. I am not on Twitter. I do not want to be on Twitter. I know what Twitter is. That's why I don't want to be on Twitter. Okay, that's the end of the poem. Okay, because I don't want to be on Twitter because Twitter is a cesspool. And here's how I know that Twitter is accessible, okay? Whenever somebody comes up to me and says, James, you've got to get on Twitter, the very next thing they say is, i got to get off Twitter, man. This Twitter thing, it's killing me. I hate it. So here's a true story. So a few days ago, uh, I got invited to a middle school to teach kids about technology. So I gave the students a high-level overview of how the Internet works, uh, and then I asked them to Google some of the topics that I mentioned. So a few minutes later, one of the kids left her desk and walked up to me. And this kid was drawn better than the other kids, but life is unfair, and they should teach that in schools. So the kid asked me to come look at uh, the search results that she found. And so she found the Twitter profile, actually. And she asked me, in this Twitter profile, why is this guy's name uh, between parentheses? Now, as you may know, the reason is that white nationalists use parentheses to identify people or things that are Jewish. And so as a response, some non-bigoted Twitter users began to voluntarily uh, put their names uh, between parentheses as a show of solidarity with Jews. And Jewish people also started uh, to use these triple parentheses as a sign of defiance. So unfortunately, I had to tell the kid about this Twitter phenomena, and then I closed the browser tab, and I said, let's just leave this place. Twitter doesn't want good people to be here. Twitter is like the alien Prometheus planet. Everything here is death. Stop touching the canisters, okay? So when people ask me why I don't have a Twitter account, I say the following thing. Opening a new Twitter account today, it's like starting to smoke cigarettes when you're 43 years old. It just demonstrates that you have no conception of what life is trying to teach us. At this point in human history, we can confidently say that Twitter should not have been invented, okay? We didn't know that in 2006 when Twitter was created, so we had to try, but now all the facts are in, okay? To be fair, I have experienced moments of temporary joy on Twitter. I've seen that video that was tweeted about the baby puppy that's trying to howl and it's so cute because baby puppies have no skills and so their attempts to howl just sound like a tiny kazoo. Moments like this do exist on Twitter. However, every delightful moment on Twitter is embedded in a matrix of sadness and hatred. There's a fish man trying to steal your money. A skull nun is pointing a judgment stick at you. Your drape situation is all messed up. Nobody told you to do that with the drapes. This is why people don't feel comfortable giving drapes to you, okay? Welcome to Twitter, all right? 
For every good thing that occurs on Twitter, multiple tragedies are simultaneously brought into existence, okay? It's like a law of quantum physics. As soon as the tweet of that cute puppy was uploaded, it immediately decayed into a tweet about vaccines causing extra head syndrome, in a tweet about how George Soros and Beyonce are hiding the fact that the earth is flat and that the international media is controlled by Jewish reptilians and reptilian Jews because yes, there is a difference and this will all be revealed when Brexit is complete and England has completely detached from the earth to become a satellite of Odin the Allfather. <laughs> Do you ever feel like Twitter has a content moderation problem? I, I feel like that sometimes. And it's not just Twitter, it's Facebook and all the other technology companies that don't want to be responsible for the content on their platforms. This is why I find it darkly hilarious to hear these companies talk about the challenges of content moderation. These executives get up and they say stuff like, you know, once we're taking this content down, the question is, where do you draw the line? <laughs> -na 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 -na. There's a lot we need to address globally. We have to prioritize our resources according to impact. <laughs> we want the progress that comes from free expression, but not the tension. <laughs> It's just like a very sad play constantly when you hear these people talk about content moderation. Now, to be fair, content moderation does pose some difficult ethical challenges, okay? But so does the collection of user data for targeted advertising. And here's how companies have responded to those ethical dilemmas. Take all the user data, follow the user everywhere. Oh my God, what just happened there? Jump out of a building, go get that data, feed it to machine learning that is made of machine learning. We shall be guided by no ethical framework besides the ancient wisdom of the snake king. Ah, I don't feel so good, Mr. Stark. I don't, I don't, I don't feel so good. So, so what have we seen? It's almost as if ethical considerations become less important when considering them would hurt revenue. Now listen, I get it. Capitalism has some nice aspects. Markets are nice. These statements are mostly true. And yet, I think that we can do better. We must do better. A big problem, I think, is that many software developers suffer from a lack of moral imagination, an inability to understand the hopes and the fears of people who aren't in the tech industry. So hate speech seems less problematic to developers because I think the groups that suffer from hate speech are typically underrepresented in the tech industry. So it's easy for developers to say things like, oh, well, hate speech is a minor problem because that danger seems so remote and so abstract. However, I guarantee you that if on Monday, a new hate group called Deaf to Full Stack Developers released a grainy video that depicted corporate shuttles being set on fire and free food cafeterias being smashed to pieces. If all this happened on a Monday, then tech companies would embrace content moderation on a Tuesday, okay? Not the following Tuesday, the very next day, that Tuesday, right? Because then the hate speech would seem real. These savage revolutionaries, they're disparaging the avocado water. This hate speech must stop, right? We know that's what would happen. So this is why I find it so painful to watch these tech companies drag their feet on making obvious decisions about content moderation. Like an important rule of life is try to always do the obviously correct thing. Don't act confused in situations of inescapable clarity. It's like when a plane lands and people get up from their chairs and then all of a sudden everybody loses their ability to retrieve their luggage. They're just bobbling around like a space-filling polygon, just, oh, where did my luggage go? It's exactly where you put it. It's there for sure. Never in the history of air travel has a piece of luggage transmuted into a sentient fluid and then moved to a different overhead bin solely for the purposes of befuddling its owner, right? Your luggage is exactly where you said that it would be because you put it there two hours ago. So know yourself, right? And when you finally decide to take your luggage out of the bin, just take it out like a normal person. When a plane lands, why does everyone suddenly become a member of some kind of interpretive dance troupe? All you need to do is just reverse the motions that you leverage to put the luggage into the bin. That's all you need to do, right? It's the right thing to do. And similarly, 
if you got hate speech on your platform, just kick it off. Now, to be clear, do not kick real birds. I know some people take these pieces of advice literally. This is a metaphor because I'm an artist and I use the language of visual poetry. Now, let me leave you with this message. Normally, I want to be very clear about this, I am normally very pro-education. But if you're a graduate student in computer science and you're researching how to make better deep fakes, drop out of school. Like literally delete yourself from the educational system. Anything that you do with your life would be better than improving deep fakes. Okay? Don't fool yourself into thinking that somebody is sitting around and saying, oh, wouldn't it be cool to take Martin Luther King's head and combine it with Gandhi's body and then create some kind of civil rights superhero? Nobody uses deep fakes to do this. Okay? It's all revenge porn and misinformation. Okay? This is very, very clear. But despite this fact, as you may know, several startups are creating new kinds of deep fake technologies. I'm not even going to name these startups because it makes me so angry, but let me talk to the VCs in the crowd. At this point, I now understand why so many of you are interested in space travel. It's because you don't want to live on a world that's been overrun by your creations. Right? Broadly speaking, I think that there is an ongoing crisis in the way that VCs decide which companies to fund. So in 2013, there was actually this really great article that came out. It was called The Unexotic Underclass, and it talked about how startups, and really tech companies in general, uh, often ignore very important demographics that aren't considered exciting by VC firms. So for example, think about teachers, firefighters, military veterans. Think about mothers, or really people who are pregnant, anyone who's pregnant. Do you understand how tricky a pregnancy is? The baby might come out too late, the baby might come out too early, the baby might come out on time, but sideways, the baby might come out on time, but consume all of the iron in the mother's body, and now the mother has anemia, right? So here's what we know. Each one of us tried to annihilate a woman as we came into existence, okay? This is just the truth, okay? All of us were potential murderers. So call me crazy, but maybe these problems are more important to solve than improving deep fakes. I don't know, so think about that. That is your homework assignment from me to you for the rest of this conference. And now, unfortunately, I must leave you because there's like 18 dudes who still want to talk to me. So thank you for your time. Thank you.